Hello, uh, welcome back, uh, everyone. And uh, now we're moving on to uh, the next session, the second session of the day. Uh, and uh, you know, this is uh, obviously you know, involving founders and and people that have uh, learned a lot in setting up fast growing uh, fintechs. And uh, obviously, specifically around the UK. Uh, and uh, uh, we're joined by the three uh, business leaders, um, Leanne Kemp, coming in from, uh, I believe it's Brisbane uh, in Australia. I know it's definitely uh, Queensland. Uh, and uh, Leanne is the CEO of uh, Everledger, uh, and she has also set up Everledger in the UK. So she's done the flight many, many times. Uh, James Butland, who's um, a VP of Global Banking at Airwallex, successful, very successful Australian fintech scale-up. And uh, James has done a lot in the last couple of years in, in building a business over here. And then uh, Eric uh, Milleron, uh, based in Brussels as we speak, uh, and he's uh, the CEO of Bankable. Uh, and uh, once again, a lot of experience there. So uh, I'll hand, hand over to our fantastic moderator, Charlie Dunningpole, who's uh, the CEO and founder of Comply Advantage. So he's got a ton of experience too. So over to you, Charlie. Thanks, Peter. It's fantastic to be here today. and. Um, Super excited for our amazing panelists that we have today who are going to share their insights and lessons learned and their battle scars from launching their global fintech companies in the UK. Um, so um, to start off with, we've got kind of three minute introduction from Leanne from Everledger, Eric from Bankable and James from Airwallet. So we're going to give a brief intro to um, their companies, what they do and how they've launched in the UK. So three minutes each and we'll go with um, with Eric from Bankable first. He's currently on mute. Hey, I saw that. Yes. So good morning and uh, good evening for the uh, Australian, uh, uh, for Leanne and others. So um, I'm Eric Miron, the CEO and founder of uh, Bankable. Uh, so Bankable uh, uh, operates and runs a banking as a service platform. So uh, we started uh, in the UK uh, 10 years ago. Um, and what we do uh, very briefly, we serve uh, fintech, so we provide engines for fintech to go to market faster. But we serve as well uh, banks, uh, big banks, so they can build on the side, uh, you know, a digital bank either for consumers or for SME banking. Uh, so um, and as well, we serve corporates. So we we don't only serve fintech; we serve various kind of uh, clients. So what we provide in a one-stop contract is a. Uh, processing, account management. So we're a mix of a digital core banking and processing card management. So the idea is to uh, connect, plug our client as quick as we can. Usually it's three to six months, or it could take three days if they don't want to uh, add their brand. And uh, we are currently uh, UK based. We, we operate across uh, Europe, but we are opening now as well the, the, the US. Um, so we are under implementation in the US. We will be live uh, in uh, Q1 uh, next year. Uh, so clients, I can mention a few clients. Uh, we work with uh, Create Agricole, ABN AMRO, uh, Spendesk in France, uh, as well as uh, Airbus and uh, Emirates. <clears throat> You're on mute. Your, your turn to be on mute. <laughs> Fantastic, Eric. Thanks a lot. Um, cool. And then Leanne? Hi everyone, Leanne Kemp, founder and CEO of Everledger. We're a company that's built a platform of provenance to enable traceability of some of the most opaque supply chains. So tracking diamonds from the source of the mine to the retail outlet. Um, we also built a digital vault, which couples into a digital wallet. So we can enable not only the capturing of that physical asset, but the digital equivalent. And how is that being transposed in terms of the currency of sustainability. So greenhouse gas emissions, the use of water. Um, and of course that plays out in many different industries. Uh, I guess we were once infamous for the work very first in the market, decoupling the ledger from cryptocurrency. Uh, and many of our clients exist in the luxury goods space, diamonds, colored gemstones, art, wine, fashion, luxury goods. I guess you can see what we're motivated by, the things I like to eat, drink, wear and watch. And, 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 and just in terms of your launch in the UK, you, you launched in the UK in 2017 or? No, we started in the heart of London in 2015. And the very first idea was written on the back of a beer coaster in 2014 in a pub in London, actually. So we've been around for about five, five and a half years now. We have six operational centers in the world and about 110 people in the company. Great. 
Cool. And then um, last but not least, um, James from Air Wallex. Um, over to you. Hi. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks, Charlie. So Air Wallex, we're a, um, a technology platform um, founded down in Melbourne um, about five years ago, 2015. Um, and really the, the premise of the company was to help um, Australian companies expand overseas. So um, enable them to open a bank account overseas, send funds overseas, um, really to help them with their international expansion. So I joined them about three years ago. I'm just after their Series A. It's a very small company of about you know, 25 people. And we've, we've scaled rapidly since then um, to about 500 people as of today. Um, expand the business out to um, Hong Kong and China um, very quickly after that Series A three years ago. And then opened our London office where I, when I joined um, Air Wallex um, a few years ago now. So regulated um, by the FCA as an EMI. Um, and really now we're helping UK and European customers go the other way if they want to expand into um, the Far East um, or that part of the world. So products really focus around payouts, collections, doing your FX, um, getting you a bank account in the country you want to expand into. And then we've added issuing this year. So virtual cards so you can pay your expenses and also acquiring so you can accept funds from Visa, MasterCard and WeChat Pay for your e-commerce uh, business. So, so that's me and, and that's our wallets and that's what we do. And you've now, you now raised $362 million in eight rounds. And yeah. you're a unicorn as well, right? Yeah, that's correct, yes. Yeah. And how many people do you have in London or, or, or UK? Um, so we've got about 15 across Europe at the moment. So split between London and then we've got um, a couple of people in continental Europe um, who are sort of building out our payment acceptance uh, product. So about 15 and we're probably looking to be maybe double that um, by sort of early next year as we continue to grow. Very good. Um, cool. So um, I'll just give a brief intro to me as well because I was told to. So um, my name's Charlie and I am the founder and CEO of a company called Comply Vantage. You can see the background. I'm currently not in my office, but there's a virtual background. So um, we've raised less than James. We only raised $90 million and we have 250 people um, I guess we do kind of money laundering technology and data to help companies not fund terrorists and drug gangs. Um, I launched the company in Singapore and New York and Romania. So I guess we have clients in 80 countries. So um, I know the pain of turning up somewhere random and trying to build a company. Um, I guess I'm English, right? So I was born in the UK. So I never launched in the UK. Well, I mean, uh, I guess I can have launched the company on day one in the UK. So I haven't kind of started the business elsewhere and then tried to launch um, in the UK, which is the subject of the panel today. So um, um, we've got basically half an hour until 10.15, um, hearing from the amazing insights from James, Leanne and Eric. Um, so we've got a range of questions for our 40 fintechs who are on the line who want to learn about the dark arts of blitz scaling and raising <laughs> porn rounds. Um, and so, yeah, so we, we have already heard briefly the business story and how, and how business started. Um, so I guess the question was, um, the first question on the list basically is, of all places in the world you could launch, why the UK and retrospectively, was it a good choice? And if you're launching again today, um, what would you do differently? Um, Eric, do you wanna start giving you the last speak? Yeah, sorry. Yes, so I think the, the reason we're in the UK, it's uh, pretty straightforward. I mean, uh, first, it's uh, we're after pro-business jurisdiction. So there's a, a few in the world. So uh, pro-business democracy. So the UK is one. There are a lot of headquarters in the, in, uh, in the UK, specifically in London. So that's uh, where we like headquarters because we can walk from one to the other and try to uh, sell our services. Uh, I think as well, there was a very strong push uh, in the UK from the government to push fintech. So there would be no fintech today if there was not a very strong push from the government. So that's a very smart move that, that was made uh, by the previous uh, you know, government in the UK. Uh, and finally, there's the FCA, because when you go to the regulator uh, website, everyone, even a kid, can understand what they're here for. And they're here to promote competition. 
Uh, I challenge anyone to find a website like that in any country. I, I speak a few languages, not all of them, uh, just five, but uh, I've never seen any website where you say, you know, we are here to promote competition so we can have, uh, you know, something for, so the consumer can have access to, uh, you know, uh, good terms. And uh, so it's about, uh, you know, opening, opening and uh, pushing firms to, uh, to go, uh, I mean, to be open, basically. So I think that the FCA is a key. Uh, so we are not regulated, but we have all the constraints of a regulated entity. So that was the four drivers for us. So um, business environment, um, opportunities for the clients, um, sound regulatory framework, um, kind of key drivers for Bankable. Um, and Lee talent Man. as well, and talent, of course. Talent, I mean, it's, it's better. I mean, there's a, in, in London, you can, uh, I don't know about, I'm just talking about the past now, but uh, we used to be able to have a, you know, a beer at night with, uh, with colleagues and all that. So those, yeah. those days are fortunately over for the moment, but uh, it's a vibrant place. I mean, uh, we are London ambassadors as well, uh, obviously, as a consequence. So I think it's... Uh, You're not happy with having to go to bed at 10 p.m. in the pub, Eric. <laughs> well, uh, well, another day, yeah. So, uh, no, 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 I think it's... Uh, we, we just need to comply. So for, for now, our office is closed. We will reopen... Uh, when we can, but uh, for me, the top priority would rather be uh, too safe, but not enough. So so far, there's no uh, no one uh, is sick in my company, and I want to keep it this way. <clears throat> very good, very good. Um, and then Leanne, um, you launched a tech in 2015, right? That's right. Yeah, accidentally, to be honest with you, didn't necessarily mean to be there, but an uninvited guest, one could say. Um, and, this, and it's your third company, right? So you, you, you could have been there, done that before, right? I have, but I often actually say it's my last. I had to promise my family on LinkedIn that I just won't do it again. So I'm going to make this one count. Yeah. And I guess, like, you know, South Africa has a big, like, diamond scene. So does, like, Antwerp. Um, given, given that context, what was the attraction of London? Or the UK? Yeah, a lot of people look at what we're doing and mistake the work in terms of provenance to drive stories to consumers and that's one element but ultimately we de-risk supply chains so um, those that bear risk are of course the greatest beneficiaries of the work that we do um, and London for us was actually about the insurance market uh, and how could we underpin the recalibration of risk when it comes to the diamond supply chain and so our work uh, is really also and has been paralleled alongside Lloyds of London that have specialty cover, um, the marine cover that exists, as well as the reinsurance market that, of course, sits behind the major frontline insurers. But I'd also say from a founder's perspective and entrepreneurship, I was appointed recently as Queensland's chief entrepreneur, a government role that specialises under the Minister for Innovation for the entire innovation and entrepreneur ecosystem. And I would say London as a whole is significantly progressive in terms of very early stage founder um, creations, uh, SEIS, a prime example, EIS, the maturity of the founder network there is by far more mature than the likes of, um, to a certain extent, even Silicon Valley. There's an ease of being able to reach in and grab that mentoring attention or even the types of funding required. Um, and for me, that was as much of an attraction um, it, as it was in terms SIS. of the financial markets. Say? You raised SEIS. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't actually, uh, because we didn't raise any capital until we were three years into the evolution of the company and I was running to revenue. So uh, we did that first to prove that particularly given we were so early in blockchain and now we've raised about 30 million in capital with large um, contributors like Tencent as a prime example and Fidelity as, a, as our early stage investors. Very cool. Um, so, uh, I guess the insurance market, e ease, of, ease of capital, and um, the um, fertile founder um, network was a key attraction for, for you. For you. Um, Very big. And, you know, fintechs are often looking directly into banking, but, you know, insurance is that awkward, weird cousin that gets invited to the table sometimes, but they're the ones that are quite interesting. And we haven't really seen a lot of big innovation uh, in insurance for quite some time. So, it's ready for a big tectonic plate shift in my eyes. Whereas I guess, whereas I guess now in short tech is super hot, right? So, um, yeah. Um, I, it's I more popular you... than Madonna was in the 80s, Charlie, which you probably yeah. were too young to remember what Madonna was like in the 80s, but she was pretty popular. Material girl, and it's no longer the awkward <laughs> ugly cousin, right? So That's right, mate. <laughs> Jane, 
James Butland. Um, you, 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 you're from the UK, so I guess you connected with Jack and the gang from Air Wallex and thought, hey guys, that's, um, that splits the UK market. Was that the kind of genesis of the idea? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think um, if you're looking to expand into Europe, um, you know, notwithstanding Brexit, um, the UK, for all the reasons that Eric and Leanne have mentioned, is still, you know, one of, I suppose, the, the leading markets for fintech. So completely agree, friendly regulator who understands fintech and wants to promote fintech, who's there to support businesses coming into the UK. So that, that for us in the FCA was sort of um, one of the... Uh, one of the key things, the ability to find talent. So because fintech's been around for so long in the UK, you have a, a talent pool that have worked in other fintech, scaled other companies, exited other companies who understand the market and have been there before. So that's another key thing with the talent base here is you can find people who've worked in these sort of companies previously. One big thing I think to mention as well about the UK market is in terms of global fintech specifically it's very uh, they're very early adopters consumers and businesses in the uk so they're happy to try new products so we've seen a huge rise in digital banks here because consumers are happy to you know move from their high street bank to a a new digital bank and and the uk kind of led the way on that because of the consumer base and businesses based here are so open to new products and um you know also comes down to regulation you know the account switching service helping people move their bank accounts so i think for all those reasons the uk for us was a natural place to base our base our european business um especially because we started off from australia um, and the uk market's about three or four times that size so it's a much bigger market um and you know for all those reasons it seemed like a good place for us it's worth mentioning as well that maybe if you are looking to expand into the UK, it's maybe it's not just London. You know, there are other places in the UK where you can build a business. You don't have to come to London. You know, you can look at some of the, some of the northern cities around, around Manchester and Leeds, which have, you know, great talent pools of engineers and people who've worked in other fintechs. You know, Oak North is based up um, in the north of England as well, um, and Atom Bank. So um, if you are looking at the UK, don't just focus in on London. You know, the whole of the UK is uh, is um, very friendly and open to to fintechs and new companies. It's a great point. So, um, the regulatory framework acts to talent in terms of um, stage appropriate um, talent who have taken companies from A to B or know what particular um, levers to pull, which particular time. Um, but then also the fact that um, specifically the PRA and the FSA had um, initiated given. Um, the bank concentration in, in 2015, um, a whole new raft of licenses, which gave opportunities to new entrants for that market. But then also, um, I guess we're stressing, um, it isn't just about London, there's Manchester and um, Liverpool and tons of other countries, um, tons of other places within the UK apart from London. Absolutely. Cool. So, um, um, to, to quote, to, to misquote Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I think, um, so, <laughs> some of the biggest obstacles tend to be the biggest blessings retrospectively. So, um, Eric, can you, can you tell us about the biggest challenge that you, you faced in your, in, 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 in your launching in the UK and how you overcame that challenge? Well, I, you know, I, it's, uh, it's always difficult to launch something new. So, uh, so I think the, the, that, that's why I found an environment where it's less difficult. So I started my first company in France a long time ago, and at the time, I think uh, there was not uh, much traction for entrepreneurs and all that, so you, you have to fight a very hostile administration. So at least I didn't have that in the UK, but it's always uh, very, very difficult to kick off something from, uh, from scratch. Yeah, so I've done that a few times. Uh, it's always a surprise. It comes all over the place, so you need to, in fact, the key thing is to uh, attract the right, right hand, left hand, so try to make sure you get the right uh, uh, talent to, to scale the company, but uh, uh, the, the most uh, the difficult thing, I mean, again, when we started uh, 10 years ago, we, what, it was very difficult to open a bank account. Yeah, so that was <laughs> the starting point. When you start a company, you need to open a bank account. Uh, now the world uh, has changed it's a bit uh, easier, but uh, I think the, the clearly it's, the, the, you know, it's to get to the first client, basically, and get to, uh, to the first client when you're building a brand new platform uh, that is supposed to uh, 
that is going to uh, you know process critical transaction. transaction. Yeah. So it's uh, if you process transaction for people in your small company, it's not a very good position to be in. So I think it's uh, our first client was uh, Deutsche Bank. So we managed to pass the wave, but uh, uh, yeah, I think then it's all about persistence uh, and never give up. Very good. So th the challenge was um, getting first client, and the answer was just being dogged and persistent. Yes. Very good. Cool. And, and then um, Leanne. What was your biggest challenge that you faced and, 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 how, and how did you overcome that? Yeah, look, 2015 was an interesting time and then even 2017 when we had ICOs that were bouncing around the world with cryptocurrency and, you know, it was the wild, wild west and to a certain extent, it still is the wild, wild west. We're such a deregulated market, but of course, governments became so interested in what was happening in the cryptocurrency space. They would sort of, you know, wash up everyone and treat everyone with, a similar set of skepticism, I would say. Um, and so for me, that was probably the biggest challenge. How do you swim with the tide, but also go against the tide in the same, in the same breath? Um, and so we knew and understood that we were solving a problem that was global day one. And so how do you, as a single founder, that have to stretch across so many skill sets, so many geographies in the world, um, as well as building out this technology that was literally like a newborn baby. You know, you'd put something in the front end and it'd come straight out the back end. Um, not everything was working. It wasn't really well documented. And I guess that was the biggest challenge. The issue is if you become a great entrepreneur, you can recognize timing because the access to funding and how you bring the team together when you decide to operate in certain geographical locations is nearly easily and mechanical to be able to uh, forecast. But there's this mix between the science and the art in understanding the timing of the decisions um, and when to take that leap. And for me, that was the biggest challenge. How did I get that right? And how I got it right was that um, moment in Techstars, which is an accelerator that, of course, breaks things up into month one, two, three, first month about the MVP and the product. Second one, of course, is about the pitch. And the third one is about raising capital. And here I am reading research papers uh, for six years uh, across the diamond industry and even all of the Git repositories that existed uh, for blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And I'm sure the Techstars mentors were looking at me thinking she's completely nuts or she's a total fake, which I'm both and neither. <laughs> So the, the, the challenge was timing and the answer was just like waiting until you knew it was correct. Yes, front ending, front ending the work that needs to be done as a founder or a founding team into understanding when is the right time. And it could be a change in regulation. It could be a change in terms of the technology maturity. It's the timing that I think is the most important piece in terms of success pathways. Great point. Um, finally, James challenges that you personally faced and, and, and you overcame in, in, in your quest for world domination? <laughs> well, yeah, I think, you know, the basics are, are very difficult and, you know, more difficult than you think they're going to be. So things like opening a bank account, like Eric said, you know, back, you know, when we started in 2017 and as Leanne touched on, you know, we're in, um, we're in the payment industry and you know, most banks then lump you into sort of the money service business bracket, you know, even though we're, so far from that, you know, we're a technology uh, company, really. So trying to open bank accounts when we first started was very difficult. Um, but then also, because we're an Australian founder startup, I remember very vividly sitting in a WeWork by myself in London with the rest of the team being in Melbourne, and you'd have maybe two or three hours of overlap per day where you can actually speak to the team. And the rest of the day, you're kind of by yourself. So you kind of have to work out, okay, what do I need to do? um today to sort of move things forward and it does come down to persistence and, and patience you know for opening a bank account setting up the company going through licensing you know it can be it can be very very difficult and, and very arduous so getting through that is the challenge um also the big thing is recruitment you know i i bought into the company you know i i you know traveled over to the offices in melbourne and shanghai um, on a regular basis, but you can't do that for everyone new who joins. So you kind of have to sell this, you know, vision of this global fintech um, with me sat in a wee work by myself saying to everyone, oh, this is, a, this is amazing. And they just see me sat there. So I think that's been the biggest challenge is, 
recruiting people and getting them to buy into the overall company objective um, because we've got a great brand name in, in Australia. Um, but we don't have that in the UK. You know, we're a very small fintech here in the UK compared to some of, you know, the bigger high street names. So it's how do we, how do we get over that and how do we sort of build that into our recruitment funnel? So I would say the basics, recruitment and logistics for dealing with the global team were the three biggest challenges I faced. Um, but I completely agree with Eric and Leanne. It takes time, it takes patience, it takes persistence. Um, and you just gotta, you just gotta keep on going. So I, I think the common things that we see in our fantastic panel today are raw determination, charisma, and this kind of will overcoming all obstacles, basically. So you have to be like a freight train in, in, in the face of adversity. So congrats to everyone for overcoming these challenges. Um, and similarly, um, the, 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 the kind of bottomless wisdom that has developed from overcoming these challenges, um, I'm sure all, 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 50 of our, of our attendees of the panel will be interested to hear um, your, your single piece of advice for fintech businesses expanding in the UK. Of, of all the many of the things that you know or have learned, um, if you had to fill that wisdom into one, one, one pithy um, anecdote or, or saying, um, what would be that um, single piece of advice? Um, I'm going to give Eric about 15 seconds to think about that. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Um, <laughs> no, I, mean, uh, I, I, I agree with James. I mean, it's all about patience, unfortunately. You know, uh, when you grow, uh, start a company, you're, usually you're impatient, you want to go fast. So I think patience is good, but the reality is to cope with patience because that's, uh, that's, what, that's how things happen. You know, uh, so if you want to create a company, it's very likely you'll have other people who will work with you. If you want to be impatient, you don't, you know, you, there's other things you can do. You can write a book. You don't have stuff. You don't need capital. You don't need anything. You just need a pen and a piece of paper. If you create a company, uh, patience is absolutely uh, important and passion. You know, it, when I'm not in a business of suffering. Yes, I, I like uh, to inspire others to, uh, uh, to uh, in fact, uh, to, to be, you know, in a good mood. So I, I told all my team, you know, uh, Guys, uh, if you want to be in a good mood, do that. I don't recommend that, but if you do that, do that on the weekend. Yes, I, I don't want to see that. I'm not interested. So there's many other people uh, on earth who have a very different, uh, you know, uh, environment than we do. So we, we live in a uber luxury. Uh, so enjoy it, smile, and uh, get the ball rolling. Very inspirational. So patience and passion. Yeah. Eric Moulin. Mm -hmm. Biography, um, uh, and then Leanne. Um, is, is yeah, I. I might talk about um, partnerships. We did speak about you know people and culture. Be, with any letter you like. Say that again. Doesn't have any to be letter. a P, but that helps. No, it. it just happened. It just happened to be a P. My dad often said it's the five P's. You know. Um, but let's just go with the with the partnership. I'm, I'm actually going to talk to uh, to Eric in in a in a previous life. Uh, Everledger was well on its journey in terms of experimentation in the payment space, and of course, we don't often think about partnerships with other scaling companies and other and other startups. And I know, sort of, you and I, um, of course, Charlie with Comply Advantage, been talking for quite some time about integrated services and how we could overlay the work that you're doing into our provenance platform. Well, Eric and I, Bankable and Everledger, went on a journey into Australia. It was quite early actually in the evolution of, of Everledger and combined those technologies together for a proof point with a very large insurance and a banking partner um, in Australia. So I think I talked to partnerships because you often think about, you know, the major incumbents or the big tech giants are being the right partners, but maybe there's something in partnerships in other startups and other scale-up companies. Again, it's all about the right timing and treating uh, a customer is not just your only customer because there could be a shared customer creating shared value in a far quicker way. Patience, passion, partnerships. And James, you, you have to start with a P, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. So I will go for um, product. So I think... The, the the biggest thing I think when you're launching your product in a new market or a new country is understanding that it's not the same as your home market, however similar they look. So Australia and the UK 
look very similar markets, but they're completely different. You know, the UK is probably, I don't know, five, 10 years ahead in terms of fintech. Um, so we saw digital banks maybe five, 10 years ago, and, and they've started in Australia in the past in the past couple of years. So you have to look at your product and see how that's going to fit into the market you're expanding into. It's very rare that the market's going to change for you. So you probably have to change your product for that market. Um, it doesn't mean completely redesigning the product, I'm something new, but really working out what are the key asks and wants of consumers or businesses in that new country. Um, and that could be very different in the UK to it is in Australia or to it is in France or, or Germany. Um, you know, you can't have a sort of standardized product across the whole of Europe because every country has different wants and needs. So I think my biggest thing would be product. If your product does fit day one, fantastic. You don't need to do that work. But I would, I would guess the market wherever you go is maybe very different to your home market. So look at your product look at what needs to change, do some deep market research um, and build that into your, your go-to market. I think um, that's a great piece. So we've got, we've got patience, passion, partnerships, product. Um, if I was going to add one, I, I'd probably add people, right? I think just, um, I think like when we launched in, in the US, it was like horrific because I think the salaries there are kind of like 10 times anywhere else in the world and you just resent paying that amount of money. So I think, um, I guess it appears like price, right? As in, do you want to pay the price for the people who have the passion? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. And then um, we could avoid this, but why not? Right. Um, COVID impact on COVID and um, what impact has COVID had upon your business and launching in the UK and your, your, your blitz scaling hyper growth towards decacorn status. Eric. The, the C question. So after P, we move to C. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, well, I, yeah, I think uh, COVID, I think uh, surprisingly, it became a business as usual. So I think the, the performance of the company, uh, you know, grew, people adapted very quickly, but I'm very cautious about that. Because uh, it's uh, when you're depressed, usually you sound fine, yes? So you have to dig a little bit because, um, you know, a lot of people, they say, oh, it's great, no problem, I'm on Zoom, I don't commit. So you, you have a, a list of uh, benefit of COVID suddenly, but I'm afraid I miss uh, having a beer with Leanne, I, I miss uh, hugging, I miss uh, you know, uh, saying hello, I miss uh, everything. So let's, let's be cautious about uh, people who adapt too, too quickly to a completely crazy reality. Uh, so let's, uh, you know, it's good, but it, it could be risky. Uh, you can, there's a risk of, uh, you know, be, being, you know, losing the plot, basically. So I'm, I'm very cautious with my team. I ask multiple questions. Uh, I don't take a fine for granted, basically. Uh, so, uh, so, of course, that, that shows we adapt. Great. But uh, let's remain vigilant and uh, try to find some uh, other format to communicate we, the, the way we used to communicate. Yeah? So, uh, uh, so that the COVID question, I think it's, uh, I hope it will be a non-question in, in a few quarters, but uh, who knows? I mean, I'm a, by, by design, I am optimistic, uh, but right now we are super cautious because uh, there's, uh, it's not the kind of risk we, we want to uh, encourage. Um, so it, it's more a short-term speed bump, which, present, which prevents you going to the pub um, but that will, that will pass, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, Leanne, you, you, you're you currently in, 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 in Brisbane. Um, what, what, what kind of C word impact are you seeing in Brisbane and globally? What's your global hubs? Yeah, look, from an Everledger perspective, it's really interesting. I mean, we are just running on distributed ledger technology and our team is distributed by its very nature. So... To a certain extent, I feel as though the world caught up to where we were always operating. Um, but the biggest question I had, and certainly I echo deeply the mental health um, comments and how the human behaviour is um, somewhat adaptive into this new normal, which to a certain extent mightn't even be a healthy normal. So I do, Eric, you know, Eric, I, I'm glad you called that out. But for me, it was interesting when I literally saw, you know, the digital twin of the diamond, of course, in the physical world is captured by us. And so when there's no movement of diamonds around the world, I would have thought that we were rendered 
are irrelevant to supply chains. Um, and in fact, we weren't. We became an essential service to the industry because supply chains became overnight nationalised. It became a concern for the sovereignty uh, of data. And um, certainly diamonds is only one small part of the work that we do, but we saw this in medical supplies, in PPE, in textiles, in food. And so we became quite embedded across our customers rapidly overnight. Just like I think we saw many technologies like Zoom as a prime example with huge uplifts. Um, and so we became the configuration tool or the reconfiguration tool for supply chains. Um, you know, setting out to be globally connected, we're still globally connected, but we started to see the closure of borders quite rapidly. And then we started to see the Australian entity start to reconfigure localized supply chains. Uh, rather than trying to wait for these goods to move internationally. So, yeah, we became a reconfiguration tool. And for that reason, we gained more customers. No one asked to, uh, for discounted services on our product. And so we were not a discretionary spend. So I hold a bit of hope that um, we might be relevant. So it, it, it's been an accelerant and a catalyst rather than, a, rather than negative for you? Yeah, most definitely. When you think about the diamond industry, most of them just still rely on a gentleman's handshake and a chit of paper and a bunch of IOUs. And, you know, that doesn't stick anymore. So they need digital tooling. And this was the prime time to do it. And I guess for you, James, like um, results from your previous company, Transwise, came out today saying they've doubled profits from 20 to 40 million pounds. And they've added now 7 million clients. And he said earlier on that, I, I guess... Um, um, Airwallex is kind of servicing e-commerce platforms have grown very quickly. So I, I guess similarly, you, you probably are um, also pro COVID, right? <laughs> I would say we were, we were pro COVID, Charlie, but I think, um, I think what we've seen, so we at Airwallex always sort of, um, we were sort of, you know, building the company around this move to, to digital, right? So this move from, companies who are trading offline historically to opening e-commerce stores, growing internationally, want to expand into uh, the UK or Australia or the US, but don't want to actually fly there and open a physical bank account. We'll give that to you um, in your home country, wherever you're based. So that was always a product we were building. And COVID just accelerated that move to, to digital. So even our, our, local, um, our local pub um, where I live and uh, our local butcher now has a website, which they would never have had, you know, for another 20 years without COVID. But through necessity for trading and the fact that you can't visit these places anymore, they've had to move online. So I think what COVID has done is really compressed about five to 10 years of that move to e-commerce, that move to digital. And that's happened, you know, pretty much overnight in the past six months. Um, and that fits with our business model. That's what we, where the direction we were always going. We've just seen that accelerate. Um, I completely agree with Eric on the, uh, on, on the mental health aspect of, of working from home full time and, and being away from the office and being away from the team. And, you know, for us as well, you know, not being able to visit our team in Shanghai or Hong Kong or, or Melbourne this year, um, you get so much more out of face to face. You know, we can do these Zoom calls and we do these panels, but the thing we miss is the four or five of us chatting before the panel or after the panel or going for a drink afterwards. And that's where you really share ideas and get to know each other. Um, and that's where you feel comfortable. You know, I can just ring up Eric and say, oh, I've got this great idea. Um, but that's the big change between, I suppose, pre-COVID and, and now is this still feels very remote and you miss all those, you know, subtle cues and the way you interact with people. So that's been the big change. I think the business side, yes, we can manage and we can, you know, communicate over Slack and email and Zoom and what have you. It's a personal interaction, which I think is, you know, it's going to be the big thing we're all going to miss in say six months, uh, 12 months. We're going to realize how much of a change that matters to business. Cool. So I think, um, that's a great point. I think just in terms of being able to um, build those relationships, it, it, it's obviously a lot harder um, in, in COVID times. I guess um, we've got five minutes left. Um, so it's really like one minute for each speaker. We haven't had a flood of Q&As on Slack, so on, on Zoom. So um, I guess um, to round it off, um, do we want to do 
one minute each on kind of top top things to take away from the um, from the newfound virtual market mission event today and um, what should the massive audience take away from from, from you Eric today um, I mean if it's uh, it's difficult to give advice for a diverse audience but I suppose you're in this panel to create a company. So if it's the case, uh, I would uh, recommend not to wait because there's always good uh, reason not to do anything. Uh, so don't wait, uh, you know, just dive, yeah. Uh. <laughs> Copy DM. <clears throat> exactly. So I'd say there was this great book that I read quite some time ago called Who Moved My Cheese? And I don't know if anyone's read it before, <laughs> but you know, when COVID first hit, I thought to myself, self, wow, yeah, customers are moving overnight, disappearing, but they didn't just move the cheese, they moved the whole bloody maze, it's gone. So um, in some respects, I think what's important is to think about the economic recovery, not just in a two dimensional time series access of X and Y, there's a Z axis that's running right through the middle of this and that's change in human behaviors the rapid uh, digital technology adoptions that are happening around the world, this global marketplace that's moving back into national sovereignty. All of these things are creating huge plate shifts in the world where entrepreneurs, innovators and startups will thrive and survive and where those that were the large incumbents are still trying to work out what just happened to them. So we're kind of playing 3D chess and um, technology shape shifting and um, for the disruptors and new entrants in the audience, this is an amazing moment. So um, carpe diem. Um, so um, we've got two minutes left. So James, do, do, do you want to give a rousing final speech about um, entrepreneurship, fintech in the UK? I think if you're looking to expand into the UK with your fintech, there's a couple of things you should, you should definitely do. Firstly, you should hire local people who've done there and, and done it before because there's plenty of talent in the UK have been through this before, setting up companies, expanding into the UK. So definitely leverage that. Also, ask, you know, I think the fintech community is very opening and welcoming. And, you know, there's many people on LinkedIn who would help you, you know, if you want to. Also, don't, don't forget government support. So like Department of Trade and Industry, you, whichever country you're coming from, your government will usually have a presence here in the UK or in your target market who can help intro you to people and get you off the ground. So never pay for anything until you absolutely have to because there will be people willing to help you for free. Um, I think people who've set up companies, entrepreneurs, love speaking to other entrepreneurs and love sharing ideas. So just ask the questions. Um, people will always, I've never had a situation where I've asked for help and I, someone hasn't helped and you know I always try and pass it on as well. So um, use the free tools out there hire local and think about your product. Does it fit the market? So, so um, for the, there's the audience like Andrew, 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 Calypso, Claudio, et cetera. You, you should all reach out to James for free advice and um, free investment happy. as well. So um, I'm more than happy to give any advice to anyone who would listen to me. Um, Peter and Harry, I think, I think we, um, do, do you want to take over from here or? Thank you, Charlie. Yeah. Um, another great discussion and to, uh, Luckily, Leanne uh, has her glass of Sauvignon Blanc um, and uh, to get into a new level of energy and uh, us uh, just getting on to our second coffees. But uh, thank you, panel. Very, very good indeed. Um, so asking Leanne and James and Eric to, to move to their virtual uh, booths so that they can have uh, meet the speakers um, with um, some of the cohort. Um, definitely worth going there and asking James lots of questions. He's um, he seems to be very willing. I know Leanne's got lots of opinions and I'm sure Eric is uh, also incredibly insightful as well. And Charlie will be off, probably off to the beach, uh, given that he's uh, somewhere in the Malfi Coast uh, as we speak. So, um, you know, once again, panel, thank you so much. Thank you. Right, uh, just beforehand, just about tomorrow. Tomorrow's the money day. We've got um, the first panel. Um, we'll have three of the top funders in FinTech, uh, Al Lukies, Rob Moffat, and Radud uh, Vla, uh, and moderated by Ben Brabin. And again, of course, we'll be talking about the pitch day afterwards. So uh, on, uh, on that note, uh, please move and meet the speakers and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much.